Um, hi, my name is Chloe Davies. I'm Head of Training and Engagement for my G-Work, the online business community for LGBT students, graduates, business professionals, and all those who believe in true workplace equality. Uh, today is our what would be traditionally our best in practice breakfast, but has now become an afternoon tea, and we're talking about being LGBTQ in sports. I am joined by some truly amazing panellists today, and know that we're going to have a really great session. Uh, so without further ado, I'm just going to ask panelists to introduce themselves just in the order that I can see on the screen so Michael you'll you'll go first. Yeah my name is Michael I'm an international swimmer I've been to two world championships and I came out as gay back in 2018. I'm training really hard currently for the Tokyo 2021 Olympics this year hoping that it goes ahead um, but I'm all about equality and inclusion and diversity because since coming out I've definitely been an, a lot better athlete so yeah, looking forward to the journey. And let's go to Nikki. Hi, uh, my name is Nikki Simmons. Um, I'm from Ireland. I'm a former international hockey player uh, for many, many years. Um, and I guess my coming out story is, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get into it a bit later, but I came out to my family when I was 21 and then I came out publicly in 2014. So a uh, long journey I had. And now I'm working in the corporate world after working a few years in sports world, moved into corporate, and I'm doing a lot of diversity and inclusion um, activities now there, making sure that my voice is heard and trying trying to change the corporate world to make sure we're more inclusive and diverse. Fantastic. Thanks, Nikki. Devin? Yeah, so my name's Devin Ibanez. Um, I've been a rugby player for about 12 years. I've played internationally um, in New Zealand, Australia, as well as England. Um, I represented the USA at the 2017 World Maccabee Games, and I signed a contract to become professional in 2019 with the New England Free Jacks. And just this year, I came out as the first openly gay professional rugby player in the US. Um, so now I've been kind of putting my attention on advocacy and trying to kind of speak about the issues around LGBTQ plus inclusion within the rugby community and in sport. Great, well, we're looking forward to hearing more. And last but by no means least, Claire. Thanks. And Devin, I thought we were going to be friends until you mentioned England rugby and now we can't. Um, so I um, I have two halves to my sports, sports story. I was an international rugby player playing for Scotland um, and Saracens, a premiership club. I then had an accident that left me as a wheelchair user in which I turned to disability sport and was lucky enough to captain the team in the London 2012 Paralympics in sitting volleyball. I then um, changed sport to athletics, javelin and discus and was going into Rio fourth in the world and then hideously broke my hand three days before doing going. But that's sport for you. Um, still with the volleyball team. Uh, we're not going to Tokyo. We decided not to go for the Tokyo round. We're trying hard now to qualify for Paris. And then I've promised myself I'm going to retire. Um, I've been openly um, as a, a gay woman throughout that whole journey. Um, and unbeknown to me was the first gay woman to be open during the um, London 2012 Paralympic Olympics, which was a huge privilege and honour. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really excited to kind of hear from more uh, from you all. So um, Devon, I'm going to start off with you. Um, you know, can you please tell us the reasons behind your recent coming out? What was your um, you know, worry for not coming out to your team before? Um, and like you've been mentioning, you're now traveling around the world and doing advocacy. So what's been the reaction so far? Um, well, so the main reason why I came out it's a bit of a tricky question to kind of narrow down to one thing. I actually came out to my family when I was 12 years old. So it's been this kind of long journey to now where only this past two months ago that I actually came out publicly. Um, for me, there was a big moment in my life where I suffered a life-threatening injury in 2017, where I fractured my throat in a rugby match. Um, it was at that point where I really sat down and thought about things that were meaningful to me beyond playing. And that's when this idea and the seed for coming out was first planted. Uh, so fast forward three years, <laughs> and I still hadn't come out. And I've been in a relationship with my partner since 2017. 
And with the pandemic and how difficult things have been, I just decided that I couldn't keep putting this off. And I knew that it was something that was important to me and meaningful to myself and my partner. And so I just decided to go ahead and do it. So that was really the catalyst for it was just the difficulties we were going through and trying to kind of take control of the situation and improve it for us. Um, the reaction has been incredible though. I mean, since coming out, I've gotten so much support from my teammates, from the rugby community and just internationally. I mean, people have really rallied around me and my partner and our story and just been so incredibly supportive. So while the response has been amazing, there is a bit of a disconnect between how supportive people have been after I came out versus how willing they are to actually put in effort into making those spaces more inclusive in sport. So I'm hoping that by speaking up, I can kind of help connect those and make it a little bit clearer how supportive our space is of these athletes. Absolutely. And uh, Nikki actually shared commonalities between yourself and Devon of being open with your family much earlier, but then coming out into the public. Um, you know, what, what has that experience been like? You said you came out, you know, publicly at 21. Yeah. So I think it's quite a like um, in that, I mean, came out to my family and friends like when I was 21 and then I think I just again I just lived that life and it just happened and I wasn't like hugely famous either so it wasn't like a big thing that was going to be a big story but I you know I did gather quite a lot of, of following and I was well-known hockey player in Ireland and and in, in the world as well I won a couple of awards so basically I think when I was coming to the end of my career I just felt it was a good time to speak about it more openly so publicly then was on a on a show called Second Captains in Ireland and on live on TV and they just spoke about it and that's where I came out so for me it was um I think we spoke when we chatted the other day was felt like a bit of a I don't know what the word is but like I felt like I needed to and I I I, I kind of had to do that for the next generation to show that it was okay, you know, and things will get better. And I didn't, I was very, very lucky and I'm very, very grateful. I didn't have too much bad things happen to me when I, when I came out to my family or anything like that um, or throughout my hockey career. But I still felt that I needed to just be that public figure and, and show that you can come out and, and everything can be fine. And again, I'm lucky I was born in Ireland. Um, even though when I was younger, it wasn't, it was still quite taboo. Um, but when I came out on TV, you know, everything was changing. Uh, we were starting to go through marriage referendum, everything was happening in Ireland. So um, it was a good time as well to, to show support. And especially as Devon says in the sports world. Um, and it's funny, we, we talked as well about the difference between male and female coming out. <laughs> it's very different. And I did speak about that on that show too, because I had a, a GAA player. So Irish uh, football player on, on with me, actually a hurling player on with me and the difficulties were very different between him and me. So we maybe talk about that a bit later um, oh, yeah. and how more <laughs> men, men need to come out because you really need to support that. Absolutely. And um, you know, like you said, it's coming off a little bit later. And thank you so much for the comments. I'm, I'm going to read some of them out after we've just uh, heard from Michael and Claire. Uh, Michael, you know, you've been a professional athlete for some time. Um, and like Nikki, we met you on screen. So some of us might have known about you beforehand, but we met you in by life uh, when you're on your own journey. You know, please tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I think for so long, kind of growing up, you know, one thing I haven't said to you about me is, you know, I've represented Great Britain and now I'm currently representing Jamaica. So I've kind of been on this whole journey. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately I've just, I was suppressing my sexuality for so long when I was younger, when I was swimming. And it wasn't until I kind of, I missed the Commonwealth Games team in 2018. And it kind of just allowed me to kind of step up, step away and realise kind of, you know, what Devlin said, like, just focus on what's important. And I needed to address so many different things about you know, my private life, obviously my sexuality. And there was a show called The By Life hosted by Courtney Act. And I think it was just a great opportunity to go away. There were six of us in a villa who was just really open with who we were into sharing our experiences and kind of different dates from the UK kind of flew in and we kind of got to pick of who we wanted to date, who we liked and who we disliked. But for me, it was a massive educational curve because I'd never been on a date before. I'd never put myself out there. And, you know, to do it on TV was a little bit daunting. But I think I was just ready, you know. I was ready to kind of be that role model for people who were, who were the same as me and to show people that it's okay that if you haven't dated in, you know, you're in your 20s. It's, you know, it's okay to question who you are and kind of go back to the drawing board in that sense. So, um, yeah, I definitely haven't looked back since. 
Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, we all fell a little bit in love with you ourselves on the show. Um, you know, Claire, you've always had an interest in sport from a very you know, young age. As you mentioned, you were doing it um, in rugby and then changed over to, you know, Paralympic sports as well. Would you tell us a little bit about more? Because you're not just a sportswoman, but also, you know, there's the, the psychology element as well. Um, so, you know, a woman of many, many talents. So I think um, the the reason it's important to me is twofold. One is, you know, when I started playing rugby at 14 years old, it was because I saw a group of, in, in those days, women's rugby was very different. And I saw a group of, you know, openly, comfortably gay women. And I thought that's where I might fit. And actually, I that was so instrumental in me growing up to be confident and, and, uh, and comfortable in who I was. And therefore, it felt really ironic to me that I wouldn't then give that to somebody else and mm -hmm. um, passing that on. When I went into disability sport, it was a, it was a strange space. Um, because it was never a question for me. And part of that is the big gap in the middle where I'm a psychologist by background and I spent most of my career in the prison service in a very male dominated environment. Um, um, and, you know, the thing about a prison is people have lots of time to get to know you. And um, if you're hiding something, they will notice it very, very quickly. And if you're not being your authentic self, then you're setting yourself up for a whole lot of trouble. Um, and so actually I was kind of in that position where, I'd always understood that if you weren't being authentic, you were never going to be able to be your best and people were never going to be able to trust you in that way. So when I went to disability sport, um, it, it kind of wasn't ever a choice, um, partly because, you know, being an elite sports person is hard, right? It's really hard. Forget the sexy bits that you see on the telly. It's hard work. And um, for me, it would have been a huge disservice to my partner and my children if, if I pretended like they didn't exist to other people. Um, but for me, the conversation shouldn't be about elite sport because you don't get to be an elite sport unless you've thrived in sport. And so for me, I really want the focus to be much more about grassroots sport because that's where the inequality is. That's where the racism, that's where the sexism, that's where the homophobia and transphobia is. And that means loads of people aren't getting the ability to benefit so hugely from sport like all of us have. Absolutely. Thank you, Claire. Um, we've had lots of hellos. London, Buffalo, New York, Brighton, Barbados. I want to be where you are, Renee. Um, we've got David from the London Stags, um, uh, Idaho. And then we've got a really nice comment. Um, hi to everyone. I'm an openly gay. Uh, I'm openly gay and was a professional wrestler for 13 years as an openly gay man. I'm now an advocate for the LGBTQ plus community, the City of London as an ambassador. I'd be very interested to work with you all and any other attendees to make a difference. Uh, we've got uh, Katie from Clearwater, Florida as well. Um, I think, you know, as you just mentioned, Claire, it's that uh, difference and, and point between you've all competed at international and Olympic level, you know, alongside the grassroots. It takes sheer determination and dedication to get to that level. Um, at a time now where I think this question was going to be very different two weeks ago. If we were asked this question two weeks ago, whether like the world is actually going to move. And now, actually, when we were just talking about before we came online, Tokyo seems like it will be going ahead in some facet. You know, what does that mean for you all as, as, as athletes who have competed at that level? Or, you know, like Michael said, you're getting ready to, to go back. Claire, you said you've deferred and you're, you're going to get ready for Paris. So I guess, Claire, starting with you and then working, working background. So actually, it's really interesting for us because um, whilst the, the, the qualification, and it's different for different sports, um, but the qualification for Paris is actually in the next 18 months. Um, and because all of those competitions where you have the potential of qualifying have been deferred, we've now got a situation where we've got kind of the best part of six qualification opportunities, but within a six month period, which as Paralympic athletes who aren't funded, aren't, you know, don't really get that support in the way that many other sports do, um, is a really hard ask in terms of financial ability for many people to participate, but also physical fitness and all of those things as well. So it's really interesting for me. I hope that 
we don't just rush back to normal. I hope that sports as a governing body, so the, the system of sports, the structures of sport, actually look at what's worked well remotely, um, what's, what are the things that we've learned whilst people couldn't take part in sport, and how can we build it back better rather than just rushing back to what was there before? Because the reality is most people don't choose the sport they want to play at early years. They choose the sport that their school plays or their local community plays and they can get to. And, and that means people aren't having a great opportunity to find the thing that they really love. And I think that's sad. Absolutely. Devon. I think it's, I mean, it's been incredibly difficult from my perspective of just how the events have been moved. Um, I kind of mentioned that I'd had this initial idea of coming out in 2017. And then my idea was I'm going to come out in 2019 when I signed my contract. And I just kept moving that goal further and further. And one of the goals was in 2021 for the Maccabea World Games, I'll come out there. And then seeing everything get pushed back, the Bingham Cup, which was supposed to be in 2020, I told myself I'd come out at that event. So seeing everything get canceled or completely moved away was a big catalyst in my decision to come out because I realized how much I've been trying to base my decision of coming out on sporting achievements and trying to pair it up with the perfect moment, right? The moment that I have a gold medal around my chest or holding up a massive trophy. Like, I think it's just the dramatic in me, right? You want that great story, you want that great moment. And when all that was kind of taken off the table, I was just left with myself, right? And for me, that's just, somebody who's known he was openly gay since a very young age who hasn't taken that step. And so having that kind of removed and realizing that I'd been basing so much off of justifying my ability as an athlete. I mean, like Claire said, you don't have to be an elite level athlete to be valid. You don't have to be an Olympic gold medalist for your experience as a queer athlete to matter. And I think that once all that was gone, that's what I was left with. I realized that even without all that, my experience was valid. And coming out is something that I was doing for me. It wasn't for the attention. It wasn't for the magic moment. I was doing it because it was something I needed to do. So that was kind of the effect that these games have kind of done for me, because I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate as an athlete. You're always focused on what's next. And you always need that event in your horizon to keep you driving and keep you moving forward. So being able to come out in this way and find motivation beyond just a sporting event that's coming up in the future and finding that motivation through advocacy and trying to inspire others has been incredibly powerful for me. Thank you, Devon. Nikki? Yeah, I mean, there's so much been said already, so I won't go too much into it, but I think an important part of this as well is where the games are. So depending on the countries um, where they're being hosted as well is really important and, and, and understanding that I, I took a, I gave a, cl a cl class the other day to my former master's school and I was just talking about that difference again between male and female and the amount of athletes that are that come out for the Olympic Games in particular, mostly female. Um, I think Rio was 80% of people um, that came out were, were female. So there is that difference as well. And, and that's why more and more athletes like Michael, like Devin, need to come out and show that it's, it's okay and it's, you know, nothing's... Well, you know, you never know what's going to happen, but hopefully it's, you know, an, a positive experience and, and also working with their sponsors, you know, nobody has lost sponsors, hopefully. And, and that's something that we need to also work together with, um, not just federations, not just the countries hosting events, but also the sponsors and make sure that they're making their athletes feel comfortable to come out as well. Um, because it's just for the next generation, for them to feel safe and, and welcomed in sport. And it's something that, Claire, you touched on there, like you felt home, you know, being in a, in a rugby team and that's what we need. We need more of. And that's, I think, something what's been really sad about COVID is people who are struggling to come out have not had that outlet. And I think that's something we need to remember as well, that they haven't been able to go to the sports club to be around people that they feel comfortable with. Um, so these having these uh, events is so much, you know, so useful as well for those people who haven't been able to to find another outlet so thank you for having it as well um, and I think that's yeah I think it's really important that we continue the conversation especially during this time. Absolutely Michael you know we to mention the training you are training for Tokyo right now although a little differently than you would normally. 
Yeah, you know, it's been super tough. I'm currently in London, just training in the pool by myself. And, you know, it's, it's hard, obviously, because I represent Jamaica, I can't go to the centre. You know, there's different high performance centres here. So because of funding, I'm not allowed to come, come in on that. Um, you know, I'm literally on the pool by myself that they've kind of given me to swim in. And, you know, I'm doing 9K every session, every day. I'm doing gym and I'm just trying to get it done. But I think everyone knows that if, hopefully, if obviously Tokyo does go ahead, it will it will be different. It will definitely be a different game. So we don't know if there will be spectators. We don't know how it's going to run, if we're going to see other athletes in the village, how it's going to be. So I think for everyone, you know, my biggest fear is the unknown. I don't like walking into the unknown. But this whole year, this whole, you know, year and a half has just really showed us that, you know, life is is the unknown. We don't know what's around the corner and we've just got to try and just keep walking one foot in front of the other one day at a time and just be ready for anything when it gets thrown at us. Absolutely. Um, Dorian, thank you for your question. I think I'm going to pick it up after this one. You know, there is added nuance that you're all LGBTQ plus and we know that there is so much stigma and fear, especially when we also look to our, you know, our siblings from the trans community. Um, but what has it meant to, you know, be a positive role model? And then in turn, why do we think that there is still so much st stigma in, in sport in comparison to what, as we would say, entertainment or the music industry or business? where there are more of us who are openly out in comparison to sport. And then we'll kind of touch on, on Dorian's question afterwards. So Devin, I'll start with you. Um, I think that one of the big differences with sports versus the rest of society is it's really been kind of sectioned off as a way that men especially have said that this is a space for manly, like manly men, right? And that it's it's something that's above the rest of society and that only the strongest and the best men will come here. And this is all kind of reinforced by this perception that gay men are not that, right? Gay men cannot be the strong men. They cannot be a dominant athlete in that way. So I think it's really reverberated throughout the entire sports community because it's so clear that it's just not a space where gay people are seen as being welcome. And that is something that it's really impossible to miss as a gay athlete growing up. When you see the type of language that they use and the way that they try to belittle other people by using sexuality as a way to bring people down, it's something that really resonates you, especially as a closeted athlete. I mean, for me, I've had coaches who will use an example of if you make a mistake in training, they'll say, well, you should go train with the local IGR team, which is an inclusive gay rugby team, because they're looking for average players, right? So there's all these messages you're getting saying that gay players are lesser and that you cannot be a successful athlete if you are gay. So I think that that's one of the big things that is still really prevalent, even as we continue to move towards and progress so many queer people, as Claire said, just aren't even getting an opportunity to get into the sport at an entry level because they feel that resistance, right? They feel that they're not welcome in that space. They look around and they don't see other people like them who feel confident speaking up about their real life experiences. So I think that until that changes, like Nikki says, how important it is for male athletes as well to really speak up about their experiences and be open about their sexuality, it's just not going to change because it's something that is just a continually repeating cycle when you don't have that representation and you don't make that kind of lasting change. Absolutely. Claire, as, as Devin said, what would be your thoughts? I think there's, I'm, I'm going to be a bit of a psychology geek here. I think there's a couple of things. One is um, you can't be what you don't see, which is exactly the point they're making. But actually for me, it isn't that more athletes need to come out. It's more athletes need to say, I don't give a shit whether people in my team are LGBT, whatever they are, I, I want them in my team. And that's what we'll create. We're, we're kind of waiting for someone to be the first. And no one, the human nature is no one wants to be the first. Um, so I think we need to do a lot more in sport to hold people account to actually saying this matters to us in sport. Um, the other thing is sport's a choice, right? And most young people grow up in sport um, being told these are the people that play sport and these are the people that aren't. So when we're about 10 years old and we create that paradigm of who we are in our world, often LGBT people don't see sport as something that, where they'll belong and therefore they never take foot inside. 
And the second bit of that is sports haven't done enough to be explicit about the fact that they are inclusive. You often hear sports say, oh, well, if we had an LGBT person, we'd do this, this and this. Well, that's a waste of time because you've got to be explicit because people are not going to come through the door unless you're explicit that they are welcome. And I think adding to that the extra lens of most governance around sport is what I would call sloppy you know most of the governance around sport is quite lazy and quite vague and sport governing bodies are filled with people who played that sport hundreds of years ago and want to hang on to what that sport was and until we make it more professional until we make there to be a cost and a implication for being inclusive I think we're going to struggle to move forward sorry that was a rant no (laughs) Go right ahead. Um, you know, I, I guess Nikki will kind of take your thoughts on this and then, you know, pick up on what you said a little bit earlier that it isn't just it isn't just the barriers of being visible within sport, but it's also the gender politics that, that, that come within that as well. And then kind of pick up on Dorian's uh, comment around, you know, the trans community and, and, and what that's meant, because it is so nuanced. Yeah, for sure. And I think, again, with this, like, uh, course I was doing the other day with the masters so they're they're going to be sports managers and the whole thing that I'm trying to push here in Switzerland because we've got a lot of sports in, uh, federations here as you probably know um for the next generation of sports managers trying to make them aware that they need to be ready for the next generation of athletes because everything's changing we've got a lot more transgender athletes we have Castor Semena's um story which has changed again today actually I don't know if you saw the announcement she's gone towards um you know, going to court again in Europe so that's great news for her and hopefully that will will change but she shouldn't have to do that she shouldn't have to go through that horrible horrible life that she's had she should be allowed to compete and that's what we're trying to teach the next generation of managers because they're going to be the ones facing these in the future um and like Claire just touching on your point there like we need to be ready we need to be better prepared the international federations are not well prepared the olympic committee are not well prepared they just brush over things or they make snap decisions world rugby devon as you probably well know not well prepared and they just went through a very very quick you know process of trying to go okay we need to do something let's do it they didn't even have any transgender athletes at the table for their first meeting so how can that be it can't <laughs> you have to have people involved in in, in the, in the sc- discussions who are actually living that you know living through being transgender athlete and being told they're not allowed to compete you know they've done that over and over and over to too many people and it's just not fair and again I, I think allies is another thing so I'm absolutely an ally to transgender athletes I think they deserve every single bit of of you know they deserve to, to compete wherever they want to compete, you know. Um, so for me, it's just a huge amount of work to be done in sport. Um, and I think, again, Claire, I've probably gone off on a rant like <laughs> as well, but I just have so much passion about this this subject, especially transgender athletes, especially intersex athletes, which we're seeing with Castor. I just, it gets me so upset every time I speak about it um, that I just want to be the best ally I can be. And I think just speaking up, us coming out, being an ally to every single letter in our community is what we need to do. Absolutely. So I think in response to Dorian, the overwhelming response is that the trans community should very much be a part of these conversations, but we shouldn't be having these conversations on their behalf. We should be speaking directly to trans athletes to ask at all levels, not only just school level, but competing level, professional level. What 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 do you need? What does this look like? You know, when we think about I think in the briefing, we had this conversation, the way that Castor has been so discriminated against, but we don't necessarily have these same conversations around Michael Phelps and so he's kind of lauded as this amazing athlete that's slightly different and very much like you were saying Devon the gender politics of it that you know sport is a manly man's and you know and and women you know Nikki we were talking about this before you you have to look a certain type of woman to you know to be a woman in sports um it's the assumptions that actually affect, you know, what what this looks like for just athletes of all kinds, regardless of how you identify, but the extra layers and nuance that come from being LGBT with this stigma that you're not enough or you're less because being LGBT means that you, you don't quite have the strength. I mean, we could talk about this part for so long because discrimination isn't just 
from an LGBT background, you know, Michael, you know, thinking about you and your journey, uh, race has played an integral part, especially in the kind of changeover and, you know, who you compete for. So I guess it would be really great to kind of bring that into the space. Yeah, you know, I think my race, you know, now flying the Jamaican flag, you know, when I was when I was representing Great Britain, I think everyone used to say, black people don't swim, that I shouldn't be swimming, I should be on the athletics track. And I think that's one thing that I was thinking that when I went to Jamaica, or when I decided to represent them, I kind of assumed that that wouldn't, that it would change things, and that I wouldn't be stereotyped in that way. But then, you know, I think all around the world, especially in the Caribbean islands, they're like, you know, you swim? What? Like, and it's just a, such a shock. And, you know, it really shouldn't be. I think it is all about those stereotypes. And, you know, obviously last year with the Black Lives Matter and, you know, the protests, I think it just was a massive wake up call to, you know, in workplaces, in, you know, sports venues, in training. You know, it happens every day. There's always that stereotype that is kind of thrown at people. And, you know, it's not nice. And I think like that's what I'm trying to really do. I'm trying to, here in the UK, I'm trying to show people that, you know, black people can get to elite sport. And, you know, you know, exactly like you said, Claire, going back to the grassroots of sport, you know, going into younger settings, you know, and speaking to more people to say, you know, why do you think that you can't go to swimming lessons? Why is it you think that, you know, that, you know, that you believe in that stereotype? Because it's almost heartbreaking that so many people are missing out on those opportunities. And um, yeah, it's been a massive drive for me, you know, because I've obviously seen that race and kind of, you know, with the color of my skin, but also with my sexuality, because I always felt like I had to be, you know, I'm, if anyone sees me in a competition, I've always got a smile on my face because that's what makes me happy. That's make, what makes me race well, you know, and in the cool room, all the men athletes are, you know, slapping themselves, being that macho man, trying to intimidate one another. And I'm just there smiling because that's what kind of gets me through listening to high school musicals. <laughs> So literally, you know, I think every athlete is different and, you know, whether regardless of sexuality, race and, you know, ethnicity, what religion, you know, we've just got to try and get rid of those stereotypes and know that, you know, no matter what you are, like you can succeed in sport. Absolutely. Claire, I'm going to come back to you. It's something that actually you said, and again, Michael picked up about, you know, being more emphasis on grassroots but also language is so integral like we've all just mentioned around you know lgbt gender but also and i you know i'm following what you said that we're the correct saying is disability in sports like actually the language of how we should talk about sports it'd be really great to kind of just get your thoughts on that and and educate us a little bit on what we should or should not say like this is the space um, so I guess just in case anyone's worried, I've just got the cap in case anyone was questioning my lesbian credentials. Um, I think, what do I think? I th I'm going to slightly disagree with Michael um, because I think it's very easy and comfortable for us to say just because a few, you know, black athletes have made it, just because a few transgender athletes have made it, anyone can. For me, that takes away the validity of actually we have huge issues of racism and transphobia and social inequality in sport. And, and unless we're going to be honest and comfortable about that and absolutely celebrate the few who've made it, but not just create the narrative that just because a few people have made it, everyone else should be able to, but really understand the barriers to doing that. Um, and exactly the same as in disability sport. Disability sport is tiny. It's a fringe you know, my sport, sitting volleyball, is arguably, well, it's the best sport in the world, right? But arguably, other than that, it's one of the most inclusive sports in the world because um, we have a very um, wide classification process. And we also, up until um, international level, we play able-bodied men, women, disabled all together. But even within that, there's 20 clubs in the UK. You know, so if you don't live near a sitting volleyball club, you're not going to be able to play sitting volleyball. And some of the trouble, I think, is a lot of coaches, a lot of systems. We're not teaching. And it goes back to what Nikki was saying. We're not teaching the future generation of coaches, of governing bodies, of, you know, sports, the people who can leverage and influence sport. We're not teaching them to be inclusive in the same way that we teach them about um, tactics and sport and all of that. And I think that's the key for me. I don't give I don't care at all what people say about disability, short of the outright obvious. You know, I'd rather people get it wrong. And I think we need to allow each other to be clumsily human and have a good conversation rather than create that narrative, which I 
you know I've said this a thousand times, Chloe. I hate the fact that our community often is so willing to attack people when they try and don't get it right and then wonder why people never come back again. And I think we just have to create that safety where we can be clumsily human, we can get the language wrong, but we can get past that to have a good conversation about removing the barriers. Thank you. I think that was a mic drop, Claire. Um, Devon, you know, you are, you're in advocacy now, you're still competing, still playing, um, but you know, what particular projects, social issues are really driving you, you know, what's really, that you're really passionate about at the moment that you're lending your voice to? Well, Nikki mentioned it earlier with the world rugby ban um, against trans athletes participating in international competition. For me, it's been incredibly upsetting to see the response from the rugby community because it's been so muted. It's been just, it very much just, it happened and everyone just went on about their lives, right? There was no, there was no immediate call to arms where everybody decided that this was unacceptable. So I've really tried to spend the time to talk to a lot of rugby athletes and trans athletes who have been affected by this and to hear it's a, impact is devastating. I mean, people who have given their lives to the sport are now questioning if they have any place in the sport at all and whether their participation was ever valid and does it throw all the work that they've done over the years into question. So to hear how alienating it has been to a community that is already widely alienated throughout society. I mean, almost all of us have already spoken, especially Claire, about that feeling of community you get from sport, right? That drive that it gives you, but also the people that it puts around you and that support system that it gives you. Rugby, for a lot of the trans athletes I've spoken to, was the first time that they ever found a sport where they fully felt welcome, while they, where they didn't feel like they had to look around and question, am I welcome in this space? So to see that get done by the highest sporting body, I mean, and just to go back to Claire, it's often done very clumsily. And it's not done with a lot of tact. And in this case, they rushed it through behind closed doors in a pandemic and did something that's going to impact trans athletes for years to come. The fact is, a lot of people are focused on the highest level. But as is what we've already said multiple times, the impact is at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. And when you take away the possibility of an athlete even competing at the highest level, now what is going to happen? Are they going to be considered for representative teams coming up in the ranks? Are they going to be given that coaching and that playing time, knowing that they can't be pushed along to the next level? On top of that, you now have other sports that are going to look to rugby and say, well, rugby did this and they must have done their research. They're a well-respected sporting body. So let's take on those same findings. So for people who don't know, they actually allowed Fair Play for Women, which is an organization that has a long history of advocating against trans inclusion at sport, in sport across all levels. And they brought them to the table and said, this is a group that is advocating on behalf of women's rugby players and for their safety, and basically just took them at their word. They used a study that basically measured the difference in impact of getting into a car accident based on mass. And they use that same argument to say that the increased mass of a transgender woman's athlete is enough of a significant difference that it would be dangerous for them to compete against what they called, quote unquote, real female athletes. So it has just been such a harmful narrative. And I really hope that people will take the time to think about how would that impact me? If I was an athlete being excluded for something I have no control over, something that is just a part of myself how would I feel about all the work that I've put in over the years? And similar to Nikki, it's hard not to rant about this because it just upsets me so much that other people don't feel like, like that, like, that other people don't get worked up in this way. And I think from a male athlete perspective, it comes from not knowing other trans athletes personally. You say, I don't see it, so it doesn't affect me. And then there's the other piece of, well, if I speak up and I say the wrong thing, I might get attacked. And so I really want to start promoting male athletes, female athletes, anybody who's willing to speak up about it to take the time to educate yourself, make mistakes, but approach it saying, I'm willing to learn and I might not always get it right, but this is something that's important to me and I really wanna support this community in any way that I can. So I'm hoping that by speaking up, I can show people that they do want support. The trans community wants your support and they want to bring you to the table and they want allies. So don't be afraid to speak up and be one. Absolutely, and they need allies. You know, the the 
the trans community are under so much pressure, so much stress, so much strain. The idea of actually stepping into the light to speak up for themselves and the fear of being victimized in that space. You know, Devin, you've done an amazing call to action. And Claire, so I think you're ready to continue on the roll. But, you know, the nuance is even more different depending on which sport you're coming into to how they then view the trans community. So hearing you from rugby, again, Claire, from you, rugby and you know, disability and sport, Nikki, to your sport and hockey and, and Michael to swimming, as an ally to the trans community, what would you hope for others who are like you or in thinking about trans people? How can they stand up and show up in your fields? So I think I'll start because I wanted to add on something to, to what Devon said. I, th I think this, I'm, I'm completely with you, Devon. It was a devastating moment. But I think the thing that made me sad <laughs> was that the the voices you would expect to hear in this space, the, the big organisations, we all know who they are, I'm not going to mention their names, were so busy fighting about who was going to take the limelight, who was going to be able to take the credit for it. Um, excuse my dog, just eating the postman. Um, that actually they, did, they couldn't organise themselves. And that's what we need to do. We need to get more structured and more organised. Yeah, I'll jump in as well. Like, I think it's, again, back to what I'm trying to do as a future generation of, 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 you know, of these people who will be on the board, who will make these decisions. And it was really interesting. Like, I had so many questions. It was really, like, everyone was involved in the conversation, but some of the questions they had were, we'd love to do something, but we don't have the education, like you said, Devon. We don't have the, you know, and I just said, okay, that's fine doesn't mean that you're going to make the policies it just means you have to step up if you see it happening in the sport that you're working in because they're all going to work in these international federations stick speak up and say look we need to look at this now and i i don't have the answers but let's find a solution together because it has to be done because it's just happening like devon you said like so quickly under the table like just or under the carpet even just happening and it's done and everyone's forgotten again um so we need to do it ahead of time there's just so many more athletes that are going to come out um who are going to transition when they're much younger as well which is another thing so the next generation will be much younger so it's not going to be the fact that they've just transitioned two years ago what are we going to do it's they've transitioned when they're 12 so why can't they compete right it's com you know, there, I know I understand it's a very, very complicated situation when somebody maybe only a year transition, what, what happens? But if it's longer term, you know, there's this that's going to happen in the future and we need to be ready and all sports because and Devon, I think your point is absolutely correct as well. World Rugby have done it now. Everyone else is just going to go, OK, great, copy and paste. And we can't let that happen. It absolutely can't happen. It has to be done much more thorough. There has to be more science behind it. And it's science and sociology. It's not just science or not just sociology. It's both together because that just will change everything as well. And that goes back to, you know, some of the, the points that we had earlier about it's how do we talk about this at school setting? How do we talk about it when people get their first experience of sport and are, you know, have the choice to love and fall in love with sport and not that it's an obligation because this is how it is part of the curriculum. So I guess, Michael, do you have any additional thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think I totally agree. It's all about education. You know, like everyone on the panel said, that. I think even I don't know and I'm you know, not educated enough on, you know, trans to understand. And I know that, you know, decisions, you know, whether it's what is my opinion or whether it's the next athlete's opinion, you know, it's got to come from the top organisations, you know, the Olympic committees and all of the different policies in place to try and really knuckle down to, you know, educating and, you know, kind of just finding out what can be done, you know. Um, but, you know, I think when I look at, you know, obviously I'm definitely trying to be like that role model and, you know, inspire, you know, everyone, you know, I think growing up, I never really had any role models. There was no one that I could see in my sport that was, you know, that was black, that was gay, that was talking about it. And, you know, I think it's heartbreaking, you know, especially in the UK, like, you know, you look at the British team and, you know, back in the day, I was the only person for many, many years. And even now, you know, there's only one person of colour who, you know, is on the cusp of, you know, making Olympic Games. And I think by by talking out, by speaking, by being that role model and obviously like just raising awareness, you know, hopefully we'll just continue people, you know, and to kind of give hope as well to society. Um, you know, and that's obviously definitely the same with trans people. You know, they need to see that 
that people are supporting them and you know looking at kind of games I know that you know Olympic Games has a pride house and um, Commonwealth Games as well has a pride house and for me that just symbolizes you know what it means to go to the top of sport and to to go and feel accepted you know I've been to I've raced in Kazan where I was advised you know obviously it's criminalized you know as in you know Jamaica it's criminalized too but you know I was I was going I was representing Jamaica and I was told not to not to wear any pride that you know not to support not to say anything and you know I was petrified and suddenly I was wearing you know we have a bright yellow team kit I was wearing my black hoodie because I didn't want people to recognize me or to have an opinion to say to me and you know just going to an Olympic Games with a pride house or all the competitions knowing that you know they have clearly stated that they are there to support athletes and they you know just that they support it I think makes it so much accepting and makes me actually excited to go knowing that there's that safe space for me so hopefully if they see it at the top end of sport you know it will just come through the grassroots up and just inspire more people to to know that it's safe out there thank you michael um we've, we've had some questions so i'm i'm, I'm going to interrupt i uh, had a question from micah says hello all so amazing to see you all um what do you see the biggest challenge for youth and teens secondary high school as uh, as they participate in athletics as members of the lgbtq plus community and i think that we've covered quite a lot of that as well but i guess maybe the stigmas around are there any tips or suggestions for how those teens find is it finding community is it you know how 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 will they break into or is it like you all mentioned education um and whoever would like to 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 answer that one don't all jump at once <laughs> i think for me it's education but not education of them education of coaches and also creating cultures where if you want to be part of a team this is what you're signing up to. You're signing up to be inclusive. And actually, I've seen some amazing work in football, in rugby, um, in other sports where, you know, some of their some of their team cultures where they've it's made them mandatory to be role models and be inclusive and be an ally. And that's a core part as the same as your technical ability is in getting into the team. And that really shifts the agenda quickly. Absolutely. Thank you. Would anyone else like to answer? Go, Nikki. I was just going to say a little bit about, I thought about America just popped into my head because it must be so like, there's a lot going on with transgender teenagers in America in different States. So how does that, like, I don't, I, it's hard for me to comprehend as well, like that a country can have so many then different rules within their different States and it can be completely opposite. Like it's just, I, I, I that's something that needs to be addressed as well. That, you know, what, what can they do? How, what will happen? Will they just move state? Like, how can they be supported? Um, there's so many things going on there in their heads. Like for one minute, you're, you're able to play and compete the next minute. You're not able to play. So a bit like Devin, you said, like you're, you're a transgender athlete and you're like, okay, great. And then the rules change, you know, what happens then? How do you, where do you go to, to get support? And I think I don't have the answer, but I just wanted to bring up the kind of discussion that it's so up and down for transgender athletes in particular and teens as well. Like they're coming to terms with changing their gender. And then you've got that on top of it, where it should be a safe space for them to feel themselves and to be able to achieve to the best of their ability in, the, in that situation. So I guess the tip would be just to reach out and find people. Like I know in the UK, you have the mermaids and um, the mermaids um, uh, charity, which are really great. They do a lot of great work. And, um, but I'm sure there's lots more in different countries. And, and that's the other point. It's, it's so different in all different countries. How do we go about that as a, as a community? It's very difficult as well. I'm seeing this in, in the corporate world. It's very hard to have a one size fits all. But there should be places like Pride House. Michael, you said, brilliant. When you're going to compete, you've got a place, safe place to go. Things like that. Reach out, look around, find people that are like you. Um, I think that's the best tip to do. Yeah, I'd love to. I think I'd just love to add, you know, go into different competitions. I'm normally I'm not sure what it's like around the world, but I've always signed like a code of conduct to say that I will be, you know, I will stick to the rules. You know, discrimination is on there and you know, why can't that be, in, you know, integrated from a young age, you know, from in schools? Because obviously when you sign up to teams, it is about fair play. It is about accepting everyone for who they are. And, you know, that goes for sexuality too. So I think, you know, that should just be, you know, part of parcel of putting on the T-shirt or, you know, representing athletics that, you know, you're going to abide by those rules and, you know, you're, you're being supportive. That's what a team is. 
Yeah, and I think that we've already touched on it, but there's a lot of different levels to the issue, right? If, if we address the policy side of things, there's so much work to be done to make those athletes feel inclusive, but also going off of what Claire's talking about, it's extremely important what the coaches are doing. And I've had a lot of coaches approach me since coming out about ways asking me, what can I do to make my sport more, my space more inclusive? What can I do to make people feel more comfortable in this space? And I think a lot of it comes from what you guys are saying about having a common value that everybody signs on for, that everybody agrees with. But then on top of that, and specifically for the men's side of the sport, it applies to the women as well, but something I really feel is necessary for the men's side of the sport is promoting a culture of vulnerability, promoting a culture where people feel like they can speak about their life experiences, where that's not seen as a detriment, right? So much of the signaling you get from society as a man is that you can't show those parts of yourself. You can't be emotional. You can't be vulnerable and still be perceived as a man, right? So I think that when you create these spaces where regardless of your identity, regardless of your sexuality, you can speak up about your experiences and connect with other people in that way, that's what's going to make those athletes feel more comfortable. They're going to see that, yes, this is my experience with my sexuality, but there are also all these other ways that people are going through things and being vulnerable and having their own struggles. It's not just about LGBTQ athletes feeling comfortable in these spaces. It's about everybody, regardless of their experiences, feeling comfortable in those spaces. So until people feel comfortable bringing that part of themselves forward, it's something that's going to affect LGBTQ athletes at a disproportionate rate. I mean, Devin, the, <laughs> just take a moment. Um, you know, but when you, like, literally, my job, um, you made me really think about just then, you know, what's happened. You know, if we look at like 2020 and we look at what happened in the US and in particular the sport of, you know, basketball and what the NBA and WNBA did in terms of Black Lives Matter and standing up and saying, as Black players, this affects us in real time. This is us it could be any of us it could be our players it could be our children and we're saying enough is enough and we're saying no and how powerful that I mean to be honest it was amazing to watch from this side of the world to actually to actually see the the NBA stand up and really show up and say no we say enough is enough we have a duty of care to our players and it makes it you know it makes me think about one of the questions that we've just got um uh, from Adrienne my boss um he says which question uh, which country is uh, do you think personally is leading the way like inclusive way in sports and what have they done that can be easily replicated and so like the NBA that's an example of what they've done in terms of you know not just LGBTQ but saying you know we, we are seeing black LGBTQ people by raising black lives and saying that they are important in our sport and we value them you know is there any other country in particular that's done something that you think is really impressive in our sport I know Claire you mentioned that there are some individual sports that are doing things but do you think that there's a country that's ahead of others that could be used as a good example um, for, for other people to share best practice from whoever has one first I, I don't see any not not in a negative way but I think I think sports are quite the sports community is quite closed so what you find is if one person creates a policy or does something in one area then the rest of the world follow it so I, I i see pockets of really good practice and i think i think the thing we're missing that we definitely benefit from in the corporate world is that sharing of best practice and that that space for people to work together on stuff rather than I think the structure and the funding structure of sport often means that people want to hide what they're doing um, and not share with anybody else. And, and that's a real thing. So I see pockets of good practice in different areas of, um, of inclusion and in different sports and in different countries. But I, I don't think I can point to one country or one sport that I would say has nailed it. Yeah, and also just to speak on the NBA, um, before we pat them on the back too quick, they did after the year. Um, <laughs> they did. It after was the just that year. bit, Devin. Just that bit, not the rest. <laughs> just that one bit. Just, even in regards to the Black Lives Matter, they after that season they decided the following season there would be no imagery allowed on the courts because it affected their bottom line, it affected their ratings, and it affected how many people wanted to view the sport. So it goes back to what Claire's saying: is that even the organizations that get it right the next season will immediately get it wrong. There's no consistency and there's nobody who's taking that holistic approach to inclusivity and setting a positive example. Yeah, it's like on and off this situation again, like we said about trans uh, teenagers, you know, it's 
go no yes no yeah and it's the same thing it's like that's not going to change that's not going to help it has to be it has for it to be sustainable it has to continue like you just said there it has to be continuous conversations bringing up these difficult conversations with people as well all the time not just like during pride not just during this month because i know so i think someone else asked about that like what about each month you know lgbt month or whatever black history month do we need them or it needs to be more than that it has to be all year long and like not just one month of gay pride not just one day of against homophobia it has to be like continuous and and i think we have the responsibility in the corporate world now for me to do this and to make sure and, and get the governments thinking more and get them thinking you know actually people are rising up you know the people are starting these movements and how are we going to support them because that will change the policies the companies, especially here in Switzerland, for example, we've got our headquarters here. And if we decide, actually, you know what, we don't agree with the policies you have for LGBT, we haven't got gay marriage in Switzerland yet. You know, big companies can step up and go, right, well, we're taking our, our money elsewhere. We're taking our taxes elsewhere. That's how we can make bigger changes, I think. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll go back to our questions, but I'm um, really great. And I can see lots of comments, amen, like very true. Um, so thank you so much. Um, you know, we we were talking and, you know, Claire, you've mentioned this a bit before, but you received your MBE in 2017 and you are recognised as a leader in Paralympic sport. But as you've just mentioned, doesn't have the same access, the same benefits as, you know, someone who's able bodied. So I guess it would be really great. You know, what, what are the struggles, but also what do we need to know and how can we help amplify and actually be allies of those who are athletes and those who are not to better back Paralympic and sports uh, disability in sports? I think for me, and, and it was a really interesting journey acquiring a disability, you know, having been hugely comfortable in the LGBT community um, to then acquire a disability and suddenly like, you know, in Soho in, in the UK in London, there isn't a single venue that's accessible, you know, and, and, and that's intentional. You know, the, the reality is we have to understand if we don't intentionally create systems and structures, we will always unintentionally create systems and structures that work for us and people like us. And so we just need to be a bit more systemic in our approach. You know, it's very easy to um, provide young people and coaches access and understanding of disability sport it's very easy for big sports clubs to open up their grounds and, and create in disability programs and and all of those things but also in a bit like I think there was a question about the gay games you know I don't want to only ever live around dis disabled people I want to I want to have a whole raft of friends who are very different to me so I think there's a real danger in in thinking oh we've got this for this community and this for this community especially when you talk about things like the gay games and I go where are the trans where is the bisexual community you know um so I think the biggest thing for me is it's not big huge changes it's not big huge policy what I call virtue signaling someone should but nobody's going to it's small pragmatic what can we all do on an individual basis that would just open the doors to a few more people and if we all did that in the sports that we're in and that whatever leverage we've got it would make a huge difference yeah I just I, I oh my totally God. I, sorry, I'm just going to just in here. <laughs> I totally agree, you know. I think, you know, going to, you know, the different competitions that I've been to, you know, I, I, want, to, I want to be recognised as being, I say, I say normal, but, you know, I don't want to always be seen as that gay black swimmer. I don't always want that label. And, you know, um, you know, although there's so much education and, you know, we've come so far for there to be a gay games, you know, having just, like, me being to an Olympic Games and not having different labels put on me. I think I really, really want that. And I don't want to be seen as different. I don't want to have to go to, you know, a, a certain meet to kind of feel, to feel justified. And, you know, I think that kind of goes back to, you know, with obviously me representing Jamaica, I know that it's criminalized out there for kind of showing, you know, being affectionate to the same gender on the streets and it's heartbreaking. But for me to suddenly go in there and say, you know, we need to change the rules and we need to change, you know, all the, all the legislation. I think, you know, we need to start at one step at a time. And for me, I think going to an Olympic Games and having the country support me for who I am, but also, you know, encouraging that, encouraging me that I am, you know, one of the only swimmers and that they support. If, I think if the country sees that, you know, they'll kind of, 
it's just one step at a time and then they'll go well hang on a second okay we do have you know a big community out here you know we've seen it on the biggest stage in you know in the world in sport so why can't we try and integrate it in that way and I think that's kind of the way I'm trying to you know that's what's kind of getting me through because I know that by me going to Jamaica and saying we need to change this and this isn't right um you know no one's going to listen to me so I'm just trying to do let my actions speak louder than words and you know just try to do one thing at a time and hopefully it will just start a conversation. Thank you so much, Michael. And uh, Claire just uh, quickly had to jump off, but she uh, wanted to say uh, thank you so much. And, and it's been really great. It was so great that we could have her voice here. Um, I, she did a little mic drop before she left. I think that's why she left, actually. Sorry. I don't know if you got off this. In around the gay games, because obviously we're talking about utilising identity and, you know, we're utilising LGBT people in sport. So what are your thoughts about the gay games? Are they a good thing? And I'm going to play devil's advocate and say, whilst I agree that, you know, as a bisexual woman, I want to see the bisexual games. I think they use the umbrella term. It might not be the one that we're all comfortable with, um, but you know they use the umbrella term for gay games. So, so what are your thoughts? Do you do you think that we need them? You know, should we have them? Or do we like them? What, what do you think, Nikki? I'm going to ask you. I'll jump. Yeah, I'll jump in quickly because um, I'm actually ambassador for uh, Valencia Gay Games um, Bid 2026. Now, I, I absolutely agree. Like, it's it, I think elite athletes need to go to Olympic Games, no matter who you are, no matter what. You are. Yeah. OK. And I think the gay games is not about that. It's about inclu inclusion. They are not looking for the most elite athletes to be there. They're, they have 15,000 people drop into a city to come to an event to play soccer with their friends, you know, bring their straight friends too. apparently there's 10 percent that are heterosexual. So basically it's like it's a get together. Sport is a center, which is amazing because, you know, we, we need people to be active. And that's really what they're trying to do. They also bring cultural aspects in. There's there's events, there's music. There's especially if you go to Valencia, for example, there's you know, I don't know if you've ever been to Valencia, but amazing historical buildings there. Culture is like thriving. Everything's just happening there. It's just it's a beautiful city. Um, so they, they build up more than just the, the games right and I know the Olympic Games do the same too but this is even another level because it's it's bringing in all the queer aspects all the you know musicians everything you've got artists you've got everything there that just makes people feel at home and again that's what it is like Claire touched on it earlier it made feel, people feel welcome and they found their tribe I guess and that's kind of the difference between the gay games and Olympic games now like you said gay they say gay they, they always get that question <laughs> they literally always and like I think it started because it was an actually an Olympian former Olympian who started it way back and yeah he did it because he didn't feel so welcome at the Olympic games I think um so originally it was very much gay men but it's developed over time and they do need to look at that and I think they are they get a lot of questions about that um because it's gay games but I mean, I call myself a gay woman, though, so I can go. <laughs> um, but, you know, they yeah. do. They de they definitely look at that. They definitely think about that. Um, but it's something different. It's just a more inclusive vibe, you know, I think, yeah. compared to Olympic Games. Absolutely. And, 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 and we at My G Work, we are one of the partners for um, Valencia. So, I'm, you know, Nikki, I'll be coming like, hi, Nikki. Now that I know that you're like top, one of the top level ambassadors, I'm like, I can get to go to <laughs> places. Um, yeah. Um, but no, we're really proud to be able to partner and be a sponsor for that too. And, you know, I had friends that, that were, at, were in Paris um, that competed and they said it was this amazing atmosphere. Devin, what about you? Well, I, I feel the same way about also what um, Claire was saying earlier, which is I think we're very quick to attack an organization if they don't <laughs> use the exact right terminology, mm -hmm. right? So I think we all can agree gay is not the most widely inclusive term. Yeah, we really, yeah. and as Nikki said, there's a lot of room for improvement around that. But if we're looking at the core of what they're trying to do and the inclusive environment that they're trying to build, I think that's a great thing. And I, I don't think it's worth saying, oh, well, this is a bad thing just because they're only using this term right now. So I think that that's a great thing that exists. And also within rugby, there's the International Gay Rugby Organization, which has a lot of the same questions, right? Because it includes all LGBTQ athletes. But the fact of the matter is, it's another organization that's existing because there was a lack of inclusivity in the most specifically men's side of the game, where majority of high level teams were mostly straight athletes, and they felt 
we need to create a space where gay athletes feel like they can pick up this sport too, or LGBTQ athletes feel like they can get involved. So those things exist for a reason. And I think that it is extremely important. I think in our perfect world, you would feel just as included in a space of all athletes as you would among athletes in your community. But right now that's just not reflected in the reality of what we're facing. So I think that until that changes, those types of communities are gonna be extremely important. And also specifically for athletes who felt ousted by athletics for most of their life, like we've talked about, how they felt like they weren't welcome. If you're an athlete now older, trying to pick up the sport and then trying to go straight into a high level team that's not social, it's just about competition. It's extremely daunting now because not only are you gonna be going into a team where you might not have felt comfortable in the first place, you also don't have the skills to compete right now. So I think that when you have these IGR clubs specifically for rugby, it allows athletes who didn't have that opportunity to pick up the sport late in life in a very supportive and inclusive environment. Yeah, you know, I think it's a celebration of how far we've come. To be able to have a gay game is, you know, amazing because so many years ago, you know, you see the history of it, you know, it would never have been dreamed of. So I think it's so great that, you know, you can have that to celebrate. And, you know, not everyone, you know, there's a very small amount of people that, you know, like, you know, like competing, you know, like kind of me, you know, committing 25 hours a week, swimming up and down on the pool, you know. So to actually go and to have fun, you know, you know at the end of the day that's what Olympic Games is about it's about you know competing and having fun but you know not everyone's going to get there so to be able to have that where you can celebrate being a who you are but be like the sports that you love and you know I think you know in the Hong Kong I've been offered you know to go to kind of do a totally different sport and um you know that does sound amazing you know I need to kind of have a break from the swimming so you know I think it is a great celebration and you know too right we do need to celebrate who we are Absolutely. And it's that sense of community, like regardless of your level, the fact that you have a passion about sport, which, you know, my, I actually been trying to get back to um, netball. I played it at school and wanted to, to do it again. It's like that sense of camaraderie that you get from even if you're, you know, a solo athlete, you play in a solo sport. But actually the camaraderie, like you said, Michael, of having your other players around you or your other teammates, even if you're competing against each other, the band that, you know, that we're going to have outside of that. But then actually you leave everything, you know, on the, on the field or you leave everything think you know on the track um we are kind of we're coming up to a few of our last questions and actually i find it really interesting that the the, the three panelists that i have left you've all actually come out on television publicly i uh, just thought this was like a, 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 a random uh, a random thought and you know in the last weeks we've seen a headmaster here in the uk choose to publicly come out um which was you know for, for i think anyone who chooses to come out in that setting regardless of where you choose to come out whether it's just to tell your family and friends is a brave move to do it live on national television is again an extraordinarily brave move um, but we know that that will help so many lgbtq plus people feel more more comfortable and you touched on this devon you know where you've actually now since you've come out had coaches and other people come to you to ask you you know what advice would you have you know what would be your approach be so I guess maybe starting with you to other coaches you know you've mentioned some of this before where can they apply empathy like what more can people do what can coaches the starting place do to help LGBTQ plus athletes feel more comfortable in their in their in their sports well, I just want to start by saying congrats to the headmaster of St. Dunstan's. I mean, that's awesome. And it was actually a really crazy experience because I had actually just done a video for St. Dunstan's, like a motivational thing for their sport department. And then they messaged me and they're like, by the way, our headmaster is coming out tomorrow. And I was like, that's awesome. perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> so I love what they're doing. Obviously their school has been incredibly supportive of him and that's been so great to see. Um, going back to the coaching bit, I think that there's a few different ways we can go about it. I already spent a lot of time talking about the importance of promoting a culture of vulnerability where people feel like they can share themselves and not feel like they have to hold personal details back about themselves because they don't feel like it's relevant to sport or they feel like it'll make them appear lesser or weak. I think that that's something that really needs to be addressed and worked on. But I think that one of the most important pieces is doing what those coaches are doing when they approach me, which is going to those athletes who don't feel comfortable in your spaces, right? Go to those communities that don't feel comfortable and say, what are the barriers for you? What are things that are making it difficult for you to feel comfortable in this space? And what are ways that we can counteract that? And I think that 
it seems like such a simple solution to just approach people and talk to them and gain knowledge from their experiences. But when you actually do it, you'll realize how many small, obvious changes you can make that you've missed. For example, shutting down the use of homophobic or discriminatory language in a sports space is seems very obvious, but it's not something that a lot of coaches focus on and really focusing on saying it's not okay in this environment. And here's why, because it makes these people feel unsafe, because it makes people feel like they can't be themselves and express themselves in sport. So I think that taking the time to really express to your athletes that they are welcome in the space, regardless of all those things, they are a part of the family and anybody who makes them feel otherwise is not a part of that family and does not share the common values of the sport. So I think that starting there is the most important thing for coaches to do and let their athletes know that they are loved. Thank you, Devin. Nikki? I love that. You're just, you know, just saying the policies and the kind of, you know, inclusive nature of sport. And that's what upset me with rugby, I think, quite a lot. <laughs> because it was always such an inclusive sport like hockey. And I, I mean, hockey, the policies are, are not like that at all, much more inclusive. But um, I'm not sure they've even dealt with the situation yet. But that's what upset me a lot because also the Olympism. I mean, Michael, you know, this Olympism, you know, those values are there but then they're able to just suddenly discriminate against athletes and that just really upsets me all the time and that's why I'm doing this that's why I'm doing more and I'm speaking up more because it just needs to be said honestly now I'm not working in the sports world anymore for a reason because I want to you know I want to be able to speak up and not be oh god I might lose my job um you know I don't have that thought anymore because I was starting to do that anyway. I was working there and I could feel the tension, right? So now I'm not working there and I'm like, okay, right, let's go. <laughs> I'm coming after you. Because I think there's a question there about sponsors. We did mention it earlier. Sponsors need to step up as well. They need to show that their athletes are supported. They don't want, like an athlete should not be thinking about if I come out, and even if I don't come out live on TV, if I just say I'm gay, I shouldn't have to worry that my sponsor is going to drop me. Like, that's just ridiculous. I'm an athlete. I'm winning everything. Why should my sponsor decide to drop me? And I think that's something that Castor actually did really well and Nike did really well with her. They stayed with her. They stuck with her. They really did. And, and that's an amazing thing that they did. And I think other sponsors can show the same. There's also a question about football, so I bring that in too, because the same type of thing, why footballers might not come out is the same reason. It's obviously fans as well. It's quite homophobic in most football supporters, but also the sponsors. They're worried that they're going to lose their sponsors. And there's only 10, I think, 10 soccer players out in the whole world. One was one was also, there was 11, but um, Justin Fashner, but he... Uh, he um, death by suicide in I think it was 1993 um very sad story there as well and that was a reason too he came out and everything everyone dropped him the, the coach hated him you know he had a really bad time also racism so there's many reasons why that's probably still kind of a hangover for people that story of, of, of Justin Fashion as well so I think there's there's many conversations about this but I think sponsors international federations need to step up as well Olympic Olympic committee need to step up and say that they're there helping the athletes because if they're not there, what can you do? Absolutely. Um, Michael, do you have? Yeah, you know, I think just in, you know, in swimming clubs, I think if there was one person or if there was a coach that, you know, kind of put out that they, or, or that I knew was either LGBT or was, you know, just had a bit of knowledge, maybe I would have come out, you know, a lot sooner. But because there was no one that I felt that was, kind of in my situation or had was going through what I was going through I just felt so alone and um, you know there is a really successful British lady coach who's come out in the UK and you know her story is amazing but every time I'm coached by her it's I feel just so comfortable I can say what I like you know I can talk about the guy that I fancy without anyone in the squad kind of looking looking at me weirdly you know and I think just knowing that there is someone there knowing whether you've got an LGBT badge on you or whether you know, you've spoken about it in the past, you know, obviously people don't need to kind of plaster it everywhere, but, you know, allies is just so, so important as well. You know, even if you're not from the community, just showing that you're willing to engage in that conversation, that, you know, you speak to people about it, that you have a little, little bit of knowledge on it, I think would just really, really help. Um, and, you know, coming coming back to the, the topic of allyship and kind of speaking up, and Nikki, you've mentioned this throughout, you know, you, you just said, 
I left the world of sport because actually I really want to make a change. And, you know, we know that you're doing that in corporate spaces. I mean, in the briefing, we could have had a whole nother session of just kind of like the brief what we talk about and you need to do this and this thing as well. Um, as many of you are, you know, you're all speaking in environments that aren't traditional to sport to raise awareness. You know, what inspired you, Nikki, to do this? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I think diversity and inclusion has been part of my whole life. I mean, um, I my family split up when I was very young, a baby, and then my mom remarried when I was six, thrown into a family of four siblings, like after, after being alone for six, you know, being the, the golden child for six years, thrown into a family of four kids. I didn't know what to do. Um, and then, you know, just then I... Uh, going through my teens I didn't know and then I came out when I was 21 then I found out my dad was gay so there's always been this like diversity and inclusion side of me and it's kind of embedded in me and then I was a, a special needs teacher so I was doing that for many years as, as a teacher back in Ireland and then I just knew I had more to give in sport so I moved to Switzerland and did the master's worked in sport and it was great and I was doing a lot of stuff for, for athletes but I just felt that it, even gender side of things in sport was just not keeping up, you know, they weren't coming up, keeping up with the world, like gender equality within all the sports, all the federations is just ridiculous. Like, it's like, they think it's fine because they've got loads of women in the, in the federation, but they're not at this level. They're not, don't go any higher than managers. So that's another story, but that's what I'm trying to do. And then I realized there's lots of companies here in Switzerland with headquarters. So global international companies here that I could go into, they had diversity and inclusion departments, but they weren't necessarily doing a lot. So I thought I can go in there as an, with another job, we spoke about this, a completely different job, but I'm just as a, as an employee pushing it. So we've just released and, and opened a, a, an employee resource group for the LGBT community in my, in my, in my job. Um, and also we've just, started a race um, and ethnicity one as well and disabilities coming soon and women too so I've been really pushing the company to make changes and we're going through a massive transformation as well so it was kind of the perfect time you know that's where I got inspired by the transformation of the company that they need to tra transform their whole culture and and that's where my inspiration came from and just driving that forward and um, it's tricky at times it gets you know, up and down. I'm like, so as you can see, I'm quite passionate about it. So then I have to like tone it down a little bit because they're not ready at all. <laughs> but I, I keep pushing myself and, and, and them to, to, to try their best to, to, you know, make some small changes, as we've all said as well. The small changes are all, all the things we need to do to build the blocks to make it better for everybody within our company. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nikki. I mean, this has been this has been actually so much fun. It's been a joy. To, I mean, some of you are, I know, but to actually kind of meet you all together and to hear you and, you know, to actually be inspired by you all and see the way that everyone's resonating. I hope that, you know, we can all follow you in the different work that we're doing, you know, to you on Michael and Devon. I hope that you can get back to competitive sport, cheer Claire on and, you know, her teaching and Nikki, just let us know where we need to kind of come. We'll be in your sessions. It's been really nice to have this time with you all thank you so much for joining us you can like always find any of our panelists on the platform you should have already signed up i'm looking at all of you www.mygwork.com uh, we are live on facebook so you'll be able to go back and re-watch this video for the next couple of days and then it will be on the platform underneath this link in events uh, i would probably say just after the weekend so please do go and check it out there share it with your friends share it among your networks you know what to do my name is chloe i'm head of training engagement uh, we have a number of things coming up next week we've got more student bites um, and it's also been yeah thank you so much to everyone who's been here who's been giving us such amazing questions and stuck with us for all this time we really do appreciate you it's thursday so i'm wishing you all a fantastic weekend i hope that you enjoy yourselves please continue to stay safe and take care of each other and we'll see you soon take care bye, everyone. <laughs> bye. bye. bye.